Warning, this content may be upsetting or disturbing to some audiences. Within moments, Baby was born. But Baby was limp, blue, and not breathing. Emergency Service Dispatchers, what is the scariest call you have ever gotten? One of the first calls I ever took. Woman calls up and asks about the process of filing a restraining order. She discusses how her boyfriend has been abusive and controlling. Mid-conversation the doorbell rings, she puts me on hold opens the door and I hear yelling. Guy barges in and starts beating on her and I'm sitting there helpless listening, because I didn't have her address yet. Luckily, I did have her name and within a few minutes we got her address and got help to her. She was pretty badly injured but lived, and he is still in jail. That call made me doubt myself and if I was in the right profession, but I stuck with it and it has been a very rewarding, though sometimes sad, profession. One that always sticks with me is the guy who phoned to tell me he'd shot himself in the head. He was slurring his words and sounded drunk. But no, he'd actually shot himself in the head and was dead by the time the crew got there. That was a weird one to get my head around. I also took a call from a 15 year old kid who came home from school to find his dad hanging. So I had to basically ask him if he was cold, could he cut him down, all the usual while this poor kid was panicking to hell. And then the kid stops answering my questions. And the dispatcher next to me gets the emergency call from the neighbors saying they don't know what's going on, but there's a kid standing in the street just screaming. I think about that poor kid a lot, and I absolutely detest his father for doing that to him, when he knew his son would be the one who'd find him. Probably the other one that stands out is the call from the woman who'd just been raped. She'd been coming home from a club, and someone had pushed through her door behind her as she unlocked it. When he left, she called me. I still remember the way she screamed when she heard knocking on her door again, and I had to yell at her to try to make her understand it was the police, and not the guy coming back. I didn't sleep well after that night shift at all. Caller, muffled voice. Me, I can't understand you, what's the location of the emergency? The caller sounds clearer, like Kermit the Frog. He gives his address and says, I'm going to hang myself. Me, sir, we can help you, talk to me. What's been happening? Caller, I just want you to move my body before my family get back. Me, please, there's nothing that can't be. Crack gargling silence. I had to stay on the line until I heard police on scene. He had a hands-free kit on. I wasn't even allowed five minutes break. I had a breakdown after. I can't describe those sounds. Haunts me to this day. I cannot describe the feeling of being so intimately involved in the moment of such a traumatic death death. He gave his pain to me. Suicidal calls and death were common. Part of the job. But this was so sudden, I was the last voice he heard. Also it was 2 AM on Christmas Day. I was wearing a Santa hat. Looking forward to seeing my family. I had to cancel and went home, spend the day alone and shaking. I can't share this with people I know, I don't want to spread his pain further. Now I have PTSD. Yay. I am an emergency helicopter dispatcher. So I get calls from EMS in rural areas. First question I always ask is, what is the closest city to the scene? I swear 80% of these people do not know how to pronounce it correctly, and 50% of them do not know how to spell it. One time this guy cut his penis off on bath salts. When he came to he realized what he did and called us directly. I work for a sheriff's office and a good friend of mine was a dispatcher. I stepped outside one day for a smoke and my buddy was standing there shaking and crying. I asked him what was wrong and he told me that he had just dispatched a call for his best friend. His friend was a former army sniper and had only been out for a few months. He was a volunteer firefighter and was responding to a house fire, rolled the truck, and had been decapitated. Guy had five young daughters. Was a 911 operator for 10 years. Scariest is probably different than worst. My scariest was an active shooter in a high rise. Just sitting on the line trying to give the best direction so everyone makes it out okay. My worst were these two, when I first started out, I worked for a rural county and some areas were very far from help. One night I got a call from a group of people who were in EM accident and their car caught fire. The girl I was speaking with was stuck in her seatbelt and as the fire spread she was in terrible amounts of pain. She kept begging me to send help and I was but it was far away. I stayed with her until the phone dropped, assuringly the phone and it melted or malfunctioned. The other was a hanging. The father called me for a welfare check and I was putting in the call when he got to the house. He said the door was unlocked, so I stayed landline while he went inside and he found his son. 
The pain in the moment he walked out and told his wife was so horrible and raw. A woman called, screaming her head off, that she had driven into a body of water, her car was filling up with water, she couldn't open the door, she didn't know where she was, etc. Kids in the car, we're all going to die. Meanwhile I'm like, what the hell do I do now? Try to find out details about where she is, we know she can see a massive shopping center but it could be anywhere even remotely close to that. Local units all fan out to the different large ponds and streams it could be. Call the Coast Guard and Marine Support Units to help. Try to find out what kind of body of water it is, how big it is etc, and she is just too panicked to answer any questions whatsoever. Managed to get the registration off her vehicle and that was it. Turned out she had driven into a flooded road, flooded from rain, not anywhere near an actual body of water. Absolutely zero danger of the water going past her knees. A three-year-old was at a campground with her family and they let her out of their sight for 20 seconds and she wandered down to a creek and drowned. Her mom found her and her father called in. While I was getting details from the understandable distraught father, a random guy camping there was doing CPR and managed to resuscitate her. I can't imagine how her parents felt, but it was like physical weight being lifted off of me. My sister works as a dispatcher. Her first week on the job, she had a man call in saying he was going to kill himself. He told her that she couldn't do anything to change his mind, he was simply trying to let her know where he could be found. She heard the gunshot through the call. Second one, she had a little girl call in because her dad was unresponsive. She knew that CPR would likely save this man, but the daughter wasn't grown enough and didn't have the strength to perform it effectively. My sister had to tell her to leave the room, because the longer that girl stayed in there trying fruitlessly to save her father, the more scarred she would become by the experience of watching her father die. I think the most genuine terror comes from child callers. I had this five-year-old call in that her dad was growling and wouldn't wake up. Okay, agonal breathing, probably a heart attack scrambling to get a confirmed address for EMS, PD dispatched to unconfirmed address. Finally confirm the address and start giving directions on CPR. Nope she will not touch him because she is scared then bursts into tears. Luckily PD arrived just after she refused and they were able to do CPR until EMS arrived. 911 dispatcher here for a large city. I get a little bit of everything and mostly it's BS. But one that stuck with me was something recently. A man called in frantic and it was really hard to get him to calm down. He told me his 35 year old girlfriend was unresponsive and not breathing. I immediately started giving this guy CPR instructions and he kept screaming I'm sorry I'm sorry my love. Tough morning for the guy no doubt. It hit me that he could have been responsible or the last thing he ever said to her was not pleasant. Never followed up on the call. In this line of work, it's on to the next one. Too busy to think about it. I have millions of people depending on me not to let the last call affect the next one. I don't know what happened other than she was a DOA. Didn't hit me until the next day. My god, that scream was deafening. All I know is there was more to the story, I could hear it in his voice. Peas. I've heard people shot in real time, parents trying to revive their dead kids first thing in the morning, but this for some reason hit me. Not a dispatcher, but one told me that one time he got a call from a 19 year old girl. It was late and she was new to driving, in the US. Her car slipped on black ice and went over the bridge. Her car sank in the river and she called 911 and he received it. He tried to keep her calm. Poor girl was an au pair from the same country in Africa. She was crying because she was going to die in a foreign country and to make things worse she didn't even know where she was. They couldn't find her fast enough. The dispatch even remembers her last words tell my sister I'm sorry I left. This story hunts me to this day. Am I'm also an au pair. Call came in and was flagged as a frequent caller on the ass end of a very rural county. The dude was just screaming. We couldn't make out anything he was saying but we had his address and sent every available unit we had. After a while the screaming started to die down and his breathing got very labored. He wouldn't talk to us but he just kept muttering. After a few minutes we realized he was praying. Few minutes later deputy arrived on scene. Heard him check in on scene and also heard him on the line. First noise I heard was him vomiting. Turned out the dude had been working on his car and the lift collapsed. The guy was in under the car but was between it and a tree when the car started rolling. He was impaled on a branch and pinned between the tree and car. Dude lived. He's a quadriplegic but he's alive. 
first legit 911 call he ever made and everyone took their sweet time getting there because it was usually nonsense. I worked as a jailer for a while after getting out of the Marines. We had a dispatcher who had two kids. Both boys one a pos that was always in jail the other younger troubled in riding a dangerous line. She got the call one night that her younger son got shot twice in a drug deal gone wrong at a public park where he was playing ball. He was dead before the helicopter got in the air most likely. The dispatch center was connected to the jail where she had to work less than 50 yards from the man who shot her son. She was pretty tore up. There was an accident once on a somewhat busy state road here. An older couple in an SUV pulled out onto the road without seeing a motorcyclist that was going well over 100 miles per hour. He rear-ended them, died instantly and plowed through the SUV, landing halfway through the windshield. The SUV flipped a couple times and landed on the passenger side, trapping the wife. Then it caught on fire. At my dispatch center we had three of us working at all times, and I don't even know how many 911 calls we instantly got when this happened. Dozens, I'm sure. After that I sent the fire department and they got on the way, this is a rural area and this intersection was probably a good 10 minutes south of them. Some bystanders managed to get the husband out of the SUV but he died in the helicopter on the way to the hospital, I believe. The wife burned alive. Honestly the worst part was right after I dispatched the FD, one of the lieutenants on the biggest police department in my county happened to be driving through there with his family and he called 911. I'll never forget how panicked and frantic he was on that call. I had never heard any of our officers like that before, let alone one of the administrators. We were pretty friendly with all of them so it shook me up. After I hung up with him I just started sobbing. Not a dispatcher myself. But the worst call I've heard of involved two friends of mine. James was a cop that had been a 911 dispatcher before he got his badge. Al was my former roommate. After I moved out of state, he moved in with James. At the time of this story, James was recovering from an injury and took a shift at dispatch because they were short-staffed. He got a call that very matter-of-factly said I am going to shoot myself please send someone to, address, to collect my body. He's a little freak because that's his address. It was Al. He tried to talk him out of it and was still on the phone when Al pulled the trigger. It messed him up for a while. My mother worked dispatch and got a call from a woman whose husband had been locked in a trailer and lit it on fire. The windows had been boarded up and there was no way for her to get out. This was in the 90s so landline, the call cut out when the cord started to burn. By the time fire and police arrived it was too late. The best she got was from a woman who was in very active labor, my mom had to talk her and her teenage daughter through delivering the baby. By the time EMS got there they had a healthy baby boy. Obligatory not an emergency dispatcher, I had a conversation with one once where we discussed his craziest work stories and his was taking the call of a man who had just drowned his two small daughters in a lake near their house. He had to stay on the phone with his sociopath asking him questions about the time and location of the murders, until the police arrived to take him into custody. He never did find out if they ever found the children or if either of them survived in the end. I've come into contact with a fair number of sexual predators and child molesters in my line of work, but I never had to interact with them immediately after their crimes and press them for details. It's a lot to ask of someone. I've always had a lot of respect for emergency dispatchers and the folks who run abuse, rape, and suicide hotlines. When I was younger, I applied to be a 911 operator for the city I was living in Northern California. I got through most of their tests and interviews, which there were numerous. The pool of applicants was over 200 for about 8 positions. I got down to the last dozen applicants then they played some recordings for us. The recording I listened to was a young girl calling 911 from inside a closet. She was crying and hysterical, saying that her dad was in the house with a gun and was going to kill her mom. You could hear the mother screaming in the background and the operator was really calm and collected. She got the little girl to keep her voice down and whisper and tried to keep her on the line. You could hear the gunshots in the background. I couldn't listen to it anymore. I didn't want her to find out what happened next, so I don't know the outcome. I knew I couldn't handle that then. I don't think I could take something like that now. I was an alarm dispatcher for about a year. Scariest I had was during the night shift. I had a woman whose alarm went off while she and her daughter were asleep. She grabbed her daughter and ran into her room and locked the door. She had a gun. The woman said she did not know why it went off and requested we dispatch the police. Protocol for the company I was with was for us to stay on the line with them while a seat neighbor called the police for us. 
About 30 seconds after we began the call for the police, she said the door handle was being jiggled from the outside, and stopped after a few attempts. She kept saying she was going to go out there no matter how many times I told her to stay in the room. Last 30 seconds of the call she was not responding. I hung up with her and called the police back and asked what was going on. They advised that police were on scene. Worst part about the job was not knowing what happened after we hung up. Glad I'm not there anymore. Not me but someone that shared their story one day. They received a call from a woman whispering down her phone stating that there were intruders in her house. She was hiding down the side of her bed. They were downstairs and she was upstairs in her bedroom. She kept quiet for 10 minutes keeping the call handler updated throughout through whispering. She then told the handler the men were coming up the stairs. Next thing the handler hears is the woman saying please don't hurt me. The handler hears a noise that sounds like a scuffle in voices but can't quite hear what they are saying, then it suddenly goes completely silent. Except there's this noise that sounds like the wind blowing through an object, followed by a quiet gurgling noise. Turns out the wind noise was the sound of the poor woman trying to breath through her lacerated windpipe and the gurgling was the blood forming bubbles as the air pumped up from her lungs pushing it out through the wound in her neck. The intruders had decided to slit her throat upon finding her and then continued to rob the house. Not a dispatcher but this was a local news story. A few years back there was a guy that was wanting to scrap an oil drum if I recall correctly. When he started cutting into it, it blew up and he caught on fire, he ran down to a nearby creek to put himself out. He passed a few days later in the hospital from the injuries. I vaguely remember hearing it come over our scanner that EMS had gotten there and some pieces of his skin were sliding off. It had to have been a horrible, horrible day for everyone involved. I was training to be an EMT, and was on a ride along. We show up to the scene and the only thing told to us was that it was a load and go, which meant rapid transport. I find the guy and he is making a wheezing noise trying to breathe. Turns out he had a brain bleed, and was having severe symptoms of high intracranial pressure. The ride to the nearest trauma center was only about 10 minutes, but it felt like 10 hours as we just tried to keep him from choking on his own vomit. With something like that, we couldn't really do much except hope we made it in time. It was definitely a wild experience for a ride along, and the craziest part was just cleaning up all the blood and vomit in the ambulance and quickly moving on to our next call. It's definitely not something I'll ever forget in my lifetime. My late wife was a 911 dispatcher for 15 years. The two worst stories I remember her telling me of were a call she didn't answer, but was on duty during and heard the playback of. A woman called that her ex-boyfriend was breaking into her house and he then beat her to death with a hammer, all of which was heard on the phone. When they were hearing it, they weren't sure what it was but found out when the officers arrived. The second was when she was doing EMS calls. A man had recently had surgery on his legs and was unable to get up out of bed or his recliner by himself. He calls because his wife is having a heart attack on the other side of the room and he can't do anything to help her. She said listening to him begging for help was the worst thing she ever had to sit through. Nearing the end of the rather uneventful night shift I took a call from a young lady who frantically announced that she was going into labor. There was nobody there with her, her apartment door was locked, and it was apparent that delivery was imminent. Childbirth calls are quite rare, for emergency medical dispatchers, they are said to be once in a career occurrences. We are nonetheless trained for this, so when the call does come, we are prepared to help the caller through delivery of the baby. What I wasn't prepared for, however, was helping a would-be mother deliver her own baby. Thankfully by the time I finished obtaining all the geo-validation information and pertinent medical history, a few minutes into the call, I could hear someone knocking on her door. It was her sister, but she couldn't get in because the door was locked. The caller insisted she was was not able to go unlock the door on account of her being in active labor. I managed to convince her to crawl to the door to let the person in, and she painstakingly did so while voicing her discomfort in the form of various moans, grunts, and profanities. She finally let the other person in and handed the phone to the visitor. Relieved because I now knew what to do, I started providing the preparatory instructions. Gather pillows, towels, blankets, removing clothing from the waist down, etc. But there was no time for prep. That baby was coming, and it was coming now. OMG the head is out. I remember hearing, followed by her shrieking oh no, oh no. The cord is wrapped around the neck. I instructed her to attempt to loosen the cord and slip it over the head, and she was able to. Within moments, baby was born. But baby was limp, blue, and not breathing. After what felt like minutes, 
but was likely only a few seconds, I decided to advise the caller that she would need to start doing chest compressions. Thankfully, before any of that started, I could hear the reassuring sound of a baby crying on the other end of the phone. With excitement in her voice, she announced that baby was moving, and the color was improving. It was a baby boy, and he was alive. The paramedics arrived and I congratulated the caller before disconnecting the call. By this time, it was past the end of the shift, and the day crew had logged on at all the desks except mine. Instead of going home the night crew had gathered around my desk to watch me take this call. After disconnecting, I was met with cheers from my colleagues. During my next shift, I was informed that baby was healthy and I was presented with a congratulatory letter and a little blue stork pin. Thanks for watching Radio TTS, hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell for more videos about 911 dispatchers. Share your own 911 call story in the comments below. And check out the 911 dispatchers playlist, linked in the video description.